and of course our keynote speaker is working. Right our keynote speaker for today is an accomplished economist with over three decades experience. Dr. Dewey Salami is an associate professor of economics at the Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University, where he leads sessions in economic environment and business. His research interests include corporate long term financial management, macroeconomic policy, corporate competitiveness, and risk management, and characteristics of small and medium enterprises as means. He served on the federal government's economic management team in 2009. His other public policy making assignments include membership of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria and the IMF Advisory Group on Sub Saharan Africa AGSA. He's also provided consultant services to the Department of International Development, DFID, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and World Bank. He's a renowned speaker and analyst. Dr. Salami was earned his first, second, and doctoral degrees in economics at Queen Mary College, University of London. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for our keynote speaker, Associate Professor of Economics, Dr. Dewey Salami. Round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be your guest this morning, oh, sorry, this afternoon now, to speak around this whole issue of non financial motivation for employees. Of course, the context that we have is that of an economy that is recovering from a recession. I will discuss this context just a bit more in a minute because in my view, some of the conversations in the public space around motivation, I suspect, don't take enough account of the nature of the context. But beyond the context, there are a number of very fundamental questions that I think those who manage human resources have to be very mindful of. As I, I came in a bit late, well, I was told I'd be speaking at 12.40, so I didn't realize it would have been in my interest to come in much earlier. But listening to members of the last panel, I actually began to wonder, what now do I see? <laughs> because quite a lot of what I had at the back of my mind seems to have been covered. A major question that everybody will deal with is the changing nature of employment and the employee. Let me repeat that. The changing nature of employment and the employee. I was speaking to an audience of consultants sometime last week. And I said to them, the concept of the office as a place where we aggregate resources for sharing is changing. Technology has meant or means that increasingly resources are being disaggregated and that the non-factory office is not going to be where people actually get work done but where they meet counterparties and socialize. Please bear that in mind. Where they meet counterparties and socialize. Which means the old notion or notions around 
physical sighting of people almost on a daily basis as part of how we manage ourselves is increasingly changing. It's going to present a whole host of challenges. Indeed, one of the questions around almost an old school HR manager trying to manage a bunch of millennials is probably one of the biggest challenges, even though we smile. But believe me, one of the biggest challenges. So that's one major question. If the nature of the employee is changing, then it must mean the nature of the employee's motivations are also changing. Do we really keep a pulse or keep our fingers to take a pulse of what motivates the employee? How many organizations actually profile their employees before they start work, before you hire them? such that you therefore know who you're hiring and therefore can figure out whether what you're offering as motivation is really motivating. I hope you understand the nature of my question. Essentially what I'm asking you is do you know your employees? If you don't, then how do you propose to motivate them? Except, of course, you will make the standard assumptions around what you think motivates people. So, a second question I have already posed. By the way, I'm not telling you that I have any answers. I'm simply an economist. And as I tell people, I'm an economist born and bred in Ijebudi. Ah, uh -uh. DNA and training alignment. <laughs> A third question that you will have to reflect upon is what's going to be, as far as employee productivity is concerned, what's going to be the role of technology especially what I call learning technology. Because whether we like it or not, the nature of learning is changing. The context of learning is changing. The content of learning is changing. The access to learning is changing. And therefore, when people increasingly tell me about motivating people by encouraging learning, I sometimes wonder whether we all fully understand what is happening. But let me reverse myself back a bit. I said earlier that the context in which we find ourselves is a context where we are in an economy that is recovering from a recession. The recovery is ongoing. But let me describe the impact of that recession so that you can understand that in the context of and contextualize employee productivity and employee motivation. Yes, the economy contracted, shrank by about 1.5% in 2016. It's expected to grow probably by about 2.5% in 2017. As an economist, what is already clear is that 2.5% growth on the back of a population that is growing at, estimated to be growing at 3% a year means that the average income will shrink by at least half a percent this year, at least. But what is worrying is this. I was looking at the numbers. And these numbers are, in my view, quite instructive. A couple of things. Between 2013 and 2016, unemployment rose from 10 to 30. Rose from
What is funnier, if you call, consider it funny, in my view probably more ironic, is that in the age group of about eight, 16 to 25, underemployment is somewhere around about 58%. What these figures already tell you is that we, are, we have a weak labor force. But what is also quite an issue is that we have, at the same time as unemployment is rising, we are dealing with severe skill shortages. Please note what I said. We are dealing with a combination of rising unemployment and severe skill shortages. Once upon a time when I tried to hire, I used to subject people to all sorts of a battery of tests. Today I don't. I ask them, give everybody a blank sheet of paper, tell them to write in one page how they got to this interview session. At that point, 80% of the candidates fail. They cannot right. Most cannot read. They cannot speak. And worst of all, they cannot think. In other words, the context in which we speak about labor is of a labor force that is fundamentally not fit for purpose. I repeat, a labor force that is fundamentally not fit for purpose. And so when people, when we start talking about motivation, whether companies like it or not, when we talk about non-financial motivation, essentially what we're looking at is to say, well, because of a recession, companies cannot raise wages. But whether companies like it or not, the educational institutions in Nigeria are not producing a labor force that is fit for purpose, and therefore, whether you like it or not, you are going to have to invest in training. So this whole idea that training as a motivation is, in my view, a misnomer because fundamentally the labor force is not fit for purpose. What should have been a public cost has already been passed into the private sector. Companies hire and for the next anything between six to 18 months, they are training people just to bring them to a standard that makes them able to work. I set this context very deliberately because some of those things that we think are motivating are actually, have actually become prerequisites for work. I hope everybody understands me. Beyond that, I was looking at the income figures, and it's very strange. Typically, Income is, when we look at it on an aggregate basis, it's wages and salaries, and it's profits. Those who earn their income from profits take 70%, about 72% of the total income pool. Those who earn their income from wages and salaries take somewhere around about 18%. But you know what's fun? Whilst profits are rising, salaries are shrinking. And salaries are shrinking for two reasons. First, unemployment is rising. And second, wages are not keeping pace with inflation. So when we talk about motivation, I'm trying to reorient our conversation. When people talk about non-financial motivation, it's very difficult to see how we don't start with the context. Today, in 2011, the minimum wage was raised to what? 18,000. Am I right? 
By the time you discount that minimum wage for inflation, today it is only worth 9,000. In other words, it's been 50% eroded. And when you look, how many companies outside perhaps the largest have granted wage increases that have kept pace with inflation? So what we are already talking about is an environment, yes, the economy is in recession, but the labor section of the economy is really under severe pressure. I repeat, the labor part of the Nigerian economy is under severe pressure. And therefore, if we are going to talk about what it is to do, to motivate, in my view, a number of things must happen. To begin with, and a point was made earlier, which I think is most germane. Leadership by example. Even though we say some companies are not doing well, the brunt of their not doing well, the brunt of their adjustments are being borne by the workforce, not by the executives. And sometimes you ask yourself, who took the decisions? By the way, I'm one of those economists who take the view that the fact that the environment is bad does not justify that corporate performance is bad. That is an issue about which we can have a very long discussion, but that's not for today. When we talk about motivation, typically we talk about two broad kinds of motivation. We talk about financial motivation and we talk about non-financial motivation. I'm not going to bother myself much with financial motivation. Companies are already under pressure and therefore their capacity for financial motivation is supposed to be limited. But let me not shy away from making the point with all the emphasis at my command that whether companies like or they don't like, wages are going to have to adjust. Unemployment may have to rise, but you cannot continue to keep workers on wages that don't take them anywhere and expect that we will make up for it by non-financial motivators. So let me quickly re-emphasize and place that squarely in the middle of the debate, that we, there is only so much that non-financial motivators can achieve. Anybody who fails to understand that the workforce has bills to pay, that the workforce requires to be properly remunerated, then whatever you get is what you get. When I asked them to produce, prepare a set of slides for me, one of my guys put this, and I'm going to read it exactly as they put it. It says here, Every employee certainly appreciates more money, but money does not buy happiness, nor does it buy engagement and loyalty. On the other hand, they put, non-financial incentives inspire and engage employees in ways that money is incapable of. And the first thing that struck me is that it almost reminded me of that saying, money is the root of all evils, but let me have some. <laughs> it's one thing to say, money does not buy loyalty, doesn't buy engagement. But it is what is typically defined as a hygiene factor. In its absence, what you want to happen won't happen. It may not be sine qua non but you need money. Now, for me, I said we must walk the walk, sorry, walk the talk. 
Number two, we must know who we are hiring. But who you are hiring must also depend on the role into which they are being hired. There are people who you need simply to comply. So if I'm looking for a compliance officer, then I'm looking for a very calm, and I'm sure half of this audience will erupt in annoyance now, but I'm looking for a very calm, accountant-like person. Looks after my numbers accurately, makes sure that things are done the way they are supposed to be done, because I don't want regulatory infractions. I'm not asking the person to be I'm not saying accountants are not high flyers, but I'm not asking the person to be flamboyant. There are, however, other functions within the organization that I do need flamboyance. I need the capacity to think. I need the capacity to take risk. I need the willingness, the courage. And so, for me, the beginning of motivation is to hire the right person. And for that to happen, you must know who it is that you're hiring. So for me, leadership is important. Profiling is very important. What is the profile for this job? Yeah, job descriptions, that's one thing. But personality profile is a second unavoidable process or requirement of a successful hire. Because what it does, it tells me what the emotional, psychological, and sociocultural makeup of any employee is. I also know up front who are those looking for job security, who are those looking for other kinds of interests. There is a, in economics, we study very early on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure most of you here are familiar with that. And when we study Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what essentially are we talking about? Yes, there are the physiological requirements, food, water, sleep, whatever. Then, next level is safety. Beyond that is where love and belonging is classified. Then esteem, and then self-actualization. Ah, the moment you get beyond safety, the moment you get into love and uh, belonging, the moment you get into self-esteem, and by the time you get to self-actualization, we are talking of people who have moved beyond the basics. And so, it's important, therefore, to be very clear what it is that people are looking for. Because failure to understand that creates a problem. The question was asked earlier, how do we deal with employees who are running their own business in the employer's time? Yes, I did hear the moderator say it is theft. Yep, it is theft. But the question is, why did you hire a thief? <laughs> and I don't mean that jocularly. If you hire the wrong person, then you really can't complain about what it is that needs to be done. So, if I know who it is, then, of course, I can begin to figure out motivation. As I said in my initial comments, that McKinsey, 2009, I think it was, had undertaken a study where they say two blocks. What employers think their employees want and what employees say they want. And let me walk through this. Employers think, and this is the order, that their employees want good wages, okay? 
that their employees want job security, that their employees want promotion and growth opportunities, so that's number four, and it's in order of importance. That their employees work good working conditions, interesting work, personal loyalty to workers, tactful discipline, full appreciation for work done is what employers think, and it's number eight out of ten. Employers also think that sympathetic help on personal problems, which is number nine, and being part of things is number ten. Okay, so what do employees actually say, according to this survey, that they do want? What is number eight on the employer's side? which is full appreciation for work done, is number one on the employee's side. The second most important thing for employees is being part of it. That thing about being part of a community doing something. The third is sympathetic help on personal problems. And of course, I can understand why an employer is not very keen on sympathetic help on a personal problem, because how many people's personal problems am I about to attend to? But don't forget, you didn't hire machines or pieces of equipment. You hired individuals. I re-emphasize that. You hired individuals. The fourth is job security. Number five for employees, wages. Number six, interesting work. Number seven out of 10, promotion and growth opportunities. Number eight, personal loyalty to workers. Number nine, good working conditions. Number 10, tactful discipline. You can see the divergence between how employers see things and how employees see them. One of the big issues that, when I was looking at this, I said to myself, okay, this is fine. McKinsey has done this global study. Has anybody done this for Nigeria? Because many of you here in this audience are HR professionals. And my question is, what is the basis of the data First of all, do you have data with which you work? Second, are these pieces of data work that is drawn from this environment or environments similar to ours? In other words, I'm putting the challenge squarely in front of you that if we are going to successfully manage, it is not the business of trying to adapt what a McKinsey says, or adapt to what a McKinsey says, but to clearly see how relevant to the domestic environment this is. And the only way you are going to find out how relevant in a domestic environment this is is by collecting domestic data. So that's, the, for me, a very important thing. If that is the case, what then are you to do? In my view, there are three things to do. And since I can see the moderator standing to my left, I know that my time's up. But there are three things for you to do. The first is around leadership. How do we lead our people? By what values do we lead our people? Are these clear, are these transparent, are these well understood? Please don't underestimate this, because in my view, having worked with quite a lot of companies, what I call the directional beacons, once they are opaque, creates problems. The second, who are our people? Who are they? What drives them? Not what do we think drives them. 
The real question is what actually drives them. I remember the f one of the first MBA classes I had to teach at the business school many, many years ago. And I said to them in that, on that occasion, we were talking about price wars. And I said, look, in economics, no business must create a value that it cannot appropriate. Because if you create value that you cannot appropriate, you are selling in the wrong market. Let me reverse that into our conversation for today. If we don't know our people and manage them on the basis of who we think they are, then we are very unlikely to make any advances in their motivation. It doesn't matter whether there's a recession or whether there isn't. For my money, the difference a recession makes is a very simple one. We argue or we contend quite often that any idiot can manage when the economy is good. It's when the economy is in trouble that we know who the real managers are. And so, for me, the question is, who are your people? What do you know of them? Because unless you know who they are, then it's going to be very difficult for you to motivate them. Let me repeat that. Unless you know who your people are, it is going to be extremely difficult to motivate them. Trying to apply textbook solutions around what motivates, in my view, is the wrong approach. The third and final thing, so I've spoken to the point about leadership. I've spoken to the point about a, a need to clearly understand who your people are. The third and final point that I put on the table for your consideration is the nature, the changing nature of work. In the local context, remember what I said, high unemployment, high skill shortages. Whether we like it or not, therefore, we are going to have to spend money to rectify that. But the changing nature of work simply means, in my view, that that point at which I align the interest of the individual with the interest of the business becomes pivotal. I must be able, by leadership, by knowing who they are, then become able to align the interest of the individual with the interest of the business. An inability to do that leaves your business very, very vulnerable. It is therefore worth your while to spend as much time, as much resources, in getting those three things right. Leadership, knowledge of your people, and the ability to align the interest of your people with the hopefully well-defined interest of your business. You are able to do that, and the points about motivation, financial or otherwise, almost become irrelevant. You are unable to do these things then I'm afraid you spend a lot of time chasing shadows. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Delivered in a very, very soft-spoken voice with a calm man, he indeed touched the subject matter and hit the nail squarely on the head. And of course, interesting discussions right there. I particularly like when he talked about the fact that sometimes, more often than not, it's about the labor force not being fit for purpose. What stood out for me in that presentation was when he compared what employers want as opposed to what employees want. And of course, he wrapped it up by mentioning the importance of leadership, truly understanding what the people want who they are really and of course the change in nature of work ladies and gentlemen please that was the keynote speaker associate professor of economics lagos business school 
Pan Atlantic University, Dr. Doni Salami. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. That was a very mentally stimulating presentation. Thank you, sir.